We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Our special guest is Jerry Wan, founder and CEO of Just Like Media, an Asian American storytelling company with many incredible podcasts to celebrate, support, and inspire. He's a storyteller, brand builder, and community leader. I appreciate Jerry's innovative approach to storytelling and sharing diverse voices. And the ways in which he addresses different issues and makes content available to his listeners. Thank you so much for the content that you share, Jerry, and for being a voice for positive change. Welcome to ROG. Thanks, Shannon. Glad to be here. I think it's really fun to be able to use platforms like this、uh, to to share stories、uh, that I don't know. At least for me, I didn't have growing up. The reason I do it, the main reason I do it, is to make sure that、uh, my kids, my two kids, and and their peers don't have that excuse anymore. Exactly. Right. That they can't say that they didn't know. Right. No, that's exactly it. <laughs> Or that it wasn't available. Yeah, and that's the thing about so many of your guests. You you touch on topics that if you were really digging in and and looking for ways to understand different populations and the ways that people are treated or solutions to problems, you could find it. But you make it available to us as our as listeners.、Um, like like for example, the one about how to raise anti racist children. I thought that episode was terrific, and just practical tips, some real life examples, some really impressive guests that you've had. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you, thank you for having me today as well. So, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, you know, it's there's a lot of different ways to to share it. I guess you know, relevant to the storytelling portion is, I was born in Korea, moved moved to the states when I was eight, spent a little bit of time here in Southern California, then off to New York, back here for college, and I think with As as with many、uh, children of immigrants or immigrants myself, you know we're we're taught that there is a specific formula to define or to achieve、uh, what we were taught as success in America: study hard, get good grades, go to good schools, get a good job, and that will earn you through money and status some sort of respectability. I, I like to think in an ideal world that it that could be true. Uh, for anybody, regardless of what your gender is, regardless of what your race is, regardless of how you pray, I, I think the reality that many people have and continue to realize and wake up to is that that's not the case for so many people. And to let people continue down this path again, whether you're a, a woman or identify as LGBTQ or you know Asian, Black, Latino, whatever you're born as,、uh, that there are separate nuances and there are different contextually relevant. Key insights and advice that is necessary to look at life in a different way. There's a big gap to fill. To one, for people who want to be successful in the traditional sense, to help them understand and bridge that gap, and two, to let people know that it's okay to get off the road. You know, try to climb a different ladder or try to go down a different path. And so the reason I share that, I think, you know, for the majority of my、uh, early and, and adult life, you know, having. Uh, been the beneficiary of amazing parents who focus on education and went to great schools and had a lot of opportunities. You know, I, I think we, myself, we we convince ourselves that that's the way to go. And so I, I did that for the you know the early part of my career, the first fifteen years or so,、um, had、uh, you know good marginal success in sales and marketing for the first ten years. Went to graduate school to get my MBA, became a strategy consultant, which you know in I guess in general is is a very envious job in an industry. Um, went to a, a very、um, popular startup, all to just to realize that I wasn't really able to be me in that scenario. And just like we talked about creating stories for people who really didn't have stories to listen to, or you know, I thought about what it meant to be me with the privilege that I had and what I could do to make sure that other kids and other people, even my peers or even other people, could really benefit from. And so, about two years ago. Um, I, I decided to not return to the corporate world.、Um, venture down this path of what does storytelling look like? What does Asian American storytelling look like? And owning that story unapologetically to be able to try to get people to understand that one, it's very, it, it's both unique and very universal. And so, what I mean by that is everybody has a very unique immigrant, refugee, adoptee story. 
But yet, if we talk to 100 plus Asian Americans, as we have on the show, on the Asian Americans, you'll realize that there are themes and there are things that really connect us all. And you don't have to be an Asian American to understand any of that. It's just you have to be able to understand from a human to human perspective what that means. And so, you know, my, my story really goes from a very traditional, uh, you know, immigrant sense, um, highly prioritizing education in my family and going down that extremely narrow path, always feeling that that wasn't really what was my path in life. However, trying to convince myself uh, through what my parents told me, what my peers told me, what my schools told me, what society told me that either I was in the wrong place and I just had to continue to change the place or that there was something wrong with me and that I just needed to work harder or listen better or have more tenacity or all these things that people hear. Um, and the answer, at least for now, and, and who knows you know, how life ends later, but for now is to jump off my own and to be able to have these conversations um, through my own platforms, but also uh, you know, been blessed to work with a lot of clients uh, of recognizable household brands and school names to be able to have these conversations in their organizations, to be able to impact them from the outside, something that I was not able to do from the inside. Uh, thank you for that story and that context to help us understand your inspiration and what you wanted to achieve and how you wanted to channel your gifts and talents and strengths into something productive and a, and a catalyst for change, like some, a way to not only, like, I love the way that you talk about celebrate, support and inspire because you give your guests an opportunity to do those three things, to celebrate who they are, to get support and to inspire all the listeners about their story, about their uniqueness. And then you know, really to create a world that does those three things as well, right? That we can celebrate and support and inspire the inclusion and the the recognition of the greatness that each of us has. So when you talked about how, you know, with all of your guests, you have found that there are some things that connect you all. What are some of those key things? The key things that we sort of connect is sort of being otherized, right? And this internalization of you know, one of the words that I think have been levied upon people who look like me and even with darker skin complexions is the word minority. It's a noun, right? And and so it feels like that is something that is us. What I think people begin to realize later in life, if they do, hopefully, is that we've been minoritized, that there's really nobody in the world that is a majority. Sure, I think if you take continental population, Asian, they're the majority, but looking at how complex and diverse we are even within that, there's really nobody who's the majority. But in America, we talk about black, brown, and Asian people as the minorities without thinking about how we've been put in that position. So I think, you know, some of the themes that have come up really is how do I find my place in this world, right? And so we've had people on the show who are, you know, like myself, moved here at an early age and trying to figure out what my new identity is. We've had a lot of people on the show who are refugees, and that's an experience that I uh, did not really understand as well, having you know prior to starting this show, to to escape war and to really narrowly escape death on many occasions to be put into a predominantly uh, white neighborhood because of the refugee resettlement programs and to try to be basically told like figure life out. And so there's a lot of these different themes that I think come about. Words like assimilation. There's all these themes that come out where there's the search for identity is ongoing and is never ending. But there comes a point where people, obviously, if you're coming on the show to talk about, uh, if you're coming on the Asian Americans to talk about your identity, you've accepted that a little bit. <laughs> of course, it is a self-selecting crowd. Um, but it is really nice to be able to share these stories that will get somebody on the other side of the conversation to say, oh my God, I'm not the only one. And so, you know, um, I'm sure as, as you do here on the show, Shannon, when you when, when you broadcast messages like this through podcasts or other media, you don't know really who's listening. But, um, you know, once in a blue moon or often, if you're if you're blessed, you get notes from people who've heard your voice and your story and they reach out to you saying how impactful it was. You know, we've been really fortunate. We uh, actually have started a c couple shows, uh, new shows here at the company that are hosted by people who are on the original show. Um, so, you know, I've, we have shows that are co-hosted by people who've never met each other in real life, um, on topics and that are important to all of us. And so it's really, uh, particularly last year in 2020 through the pandemic, when people felt so alone and people felt so confused as, as, as we were doing the right thing and staying home for one another, 
uh, that it found an ability to be able to connect, um, you know, and in particular uh, for my community in the last few months, um, I don't know when folks are going to be hearing this, but, um, you know, through the early part of 2021, it seems as though the media finally decided to cover what we've known all along, which is discrimination, hatred, and violence against Asian Americans. And uh, the voices that um, have always been there were finally starting to get amplified. And so that was really, you know, that was really nice to see. Of course, you don't ever want the reason for success or any sort of good to come from evil. Um, but, you know, uh, silver lining, if you call it, um, is that people have been more interested in hearing our stories and finally understanding how complex we are, complicated we are to talk about, and how there's really nothing to be ashamed of. And that at the end of the day, you know, we're all just individually and collectively human beings trying to get through uh, this thing called life. When we come back, Jerry will share his perspectives on how to invest in authentic executive presence from the inside out versus the outside in. Introducing the brand new Quad Pod Podcast Network. At Quad Pod, we have a variety of podcasts that are as unique as you are. Visit QODPOD.com. The Quad Pod Podcast Network. That's QODPOD.com. And we're back with founder, CEO, Just Like Media, Jerry Wan. I work with a lot of the APA, ERGs, the employee resource groups or the um, employee business groups who are APA oriented. And this topic comes up a lot. And if you were speaking to them now, what what's your advice on how to develop executive presence? That's a big one because some of the stuff you can't be as bold about, but people have to decide if that's the ship that they want to ride. You know, I, I think, again, when it comes to topics like evaluation and promotion and um, a rubric to judge executive presence or, you know, progress, uh, we have always been told, many of us, to to live in a, in a permission mindset, right? So you have to be promoted. You have to be given a bonus, even though these things that we, we've been taught that we earn Largely, it goes to a, a black box or some committee of sorts to be granted something, right? And so to be able to really look at that relationship or that premise from an opposite way and saying, how much do I want to be here? Am I allowed to be myself? Can I be successful? And, and there's a lot of different words for it, right? Like code switch and other things where we have been told to minimize ourselves, to make ourselves small. Companies like to say, bring your authentic self to work, but not like that. Right. And so and that's not just for people who look like me. There are people who wear their hair differently. Right. Who have, you know, religious or other cultural significance uh, clothing or headgear that they you know want to wear as if the work that we do is dictated by how we show up to work. And so on that note, I, I think it's really figuring out, like, is this a place you, you know, can can nurture you in your success? That's up to you to decide. If it's not, should you consider leaving to somewhere that might be better for your mental health? Um, if not, do you want to stay and try to fix it? Can you fix it? Or three, and who are we to judge anybody else's situation? Like, if you need this money or whatever, like, how much can you tolerate before you decide it's not? I, I think those are important questions to ask yourselves constantly, whether it is on a regular interval or with yourself or with a coach or whatever it is. Where, where I come from most recently in the consulting world, it's a big pyramid, right? It's, it's a large organization. We have like 300,000 people that work there and everybody wants to make managing director. That's supposed to be the, the top of the pyramid. Well, what if you don't want to, right? What if I, the, the sacrifices that I need to make with my family, with my finances, with other things don't make me want to, and yet I'm continuing to be judged by how I show up to work and how I prioritize work relative to other people. And so, you know, again, I, I think executive presence, if you want to learn it, you can code switch and learn it all the, all, you know, the whole way through. Like, I don't really have a, a, a problem or a challenge, whether it is uh, given, learned, or, you know, born with, having a large voice presence in a room of anybody, right? The loudest person oftentimes, sometimes, is seen as the smartest person, the person who speaks with the most conviction, regardless of the quality of the words that come out of their mouth, is seen as credible. I mean, we see you know examples of this everywhere. Um, 
And you're like, how the hell does that person, you know, and it's usually uh, rooted in audacity, right? And so the audacity to think that your opinion matters more than the next person, right? And I think we're going through an interesting generational change. And so I think if you talk to my parents' generation or people who were early on, or even, um, I don't even want to say older, but early on in their immigrant journey, they come to this country expecting to be treated differently because their primary identity is Korean, Chinese, whatever, right? Um, they don't consider themselves American, maybe by citizenship if they get naturalized or otherwise. But from an actual identity perspective, when we talk about Asian American as a term, do my parents identify as that? I don't know, right? And so, you know, uh, or, you know, I, I guess, you know, even for European Americans, right? If somebody from France moves here in their 30s, they're always going to be a French person. They're not going to be American. And, and, and so why that's important, I think, is as we exist in these rooms, it really sets the tone of what our expectation is on how we get treated. And so if you consider yourself a guest in this country and somebody says something not nice to you, then you're like, well, yeah, I expected a little bit of that. And so that I think also plays a role. So like, here's a fun one. So a lot of people, a lot of Asian Americans hate, hate this question, right? Like, where are you from LA? No, where are you really from? Right? I don't like that question. Cause obviously the intent of the question is to make me feel like we are not the same. And that's and but for her, she's like, of course I'm not the same. I'm not American. Well, it's very similar to, I mean, it it is similar to gender identity as well, right? Because we judge by what we see and we make assumptions and we go full forward with that. I think it's a really important step in the right direction of creating environments of inclusion and belonging where we we greet each person with curiosity as opposed to judgment and you know, trying to sort them out into certain kinds of buckets. So what are some ways that you have experienced generosity in the workplace? You've had several different careers and you, you know, you have your own business. So what are ways that you experience generosity at work? I think generosity at work really from a mentorship perspective is to find people who will help you when that, whether it is, you know, outside or inside the scope of, of, of their work. Right. Um, I think it's having empathy to realize that, you know, and, and this is um, uh, gender, race, creed, agnostic, right? Um, it is to be able to use your privilege, what you have, to be able to bring somebody in a conversation or an opportunity um, to to coach instead of to reprimand, uh, to build up instead of putting down. I, I think when we, we we often, regardless of who you are, uh, because we're human beings, we, we often forget what it felt like to be the new person when we get past that and have, you know, some sort of status or, or power in a relationship. It's hard. Uh, I, I think the good ones, the people that I've benefited from, the people who I, I try to emulate and to try to uh, be more like today are the ones who still remember what it meant to be the lowest po you know, person, the youngest person, the only person in the room. And what I am... Uh, you know, encouraged by through my life experiences and just what I see daily too is people who uh, go outside of their identities, people who use their privilege, whatever that looks like, to be able to provide opportunities for people um, that would not otherwise get that. And so I think, you know, gener generosity, I, I think when we think about that word uh, objectively is usually financially associated, right? You're, you're giving money, you're giving something, but giving opportunity, giving a sense of belonging, and more importantly, a, that sense of worth, I think is really the, the best gift that you can give. And, and what you do here on the show and what I do on other shows is that gift, right? To, to tell people, hey, I think your story matters and I want to use my platform, which is a privilege that I have, to be able to share your story with other people. There's no better that, that I think is the most humbling thing that anybody can hear for somebody to say, I think your story matters is for so long. And, you know, we all deal with imposter syndrome and self-doubt, and that's regardless of what you look like. But for somebody to say, I think you should come on my podcast. I think you should write a book. I want to pay you money to come to my organization and share your story uh, is a lot to deal with. Um, 
And even, even for people like you and me, we, we do this professionally. Every single time it happens, you're like, holy crap. Like, why, why are you paying me to, to do this? Right. And, and so, um, but, but I think that's the generosity. I, I think it's empowerment. It's, it's confidence building. Um, cause nobody ever says like, oh, I shouldn't have shared my story. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Especially when yeah. they get the feedback from the listener about how they could relate to the story or what it taught them or what it, you know, the kind of courage that it inspired in them because they thought, oh my gosh, you know, look, you, you took this leap. And then because of that, you got to this place. So I think it's that shared understanding that we have about, you know, the human experience of, like you said before, just, you know, we're all trying to make our way the best we can and that we don't get a second shot at this. So how can we use the one chance we get at this life to do something useful and and productive? So is there a favorite quote that you have or like a mantra or something that you think about that gives you inspiration? Um, You know, growing up, it was Hakuna Matata. Um, Well, because think about it. Like, so if if you don't know, if you're not familiar with Lion King, Hakuna Matata is, is, um, it's the problem-free philosophy, right? Like, Basically, don't worry about anything. Everything will take care of itself. Um, it doesn't. Uh, you need to work your ass off. You need to put yourself in situations where great things happen. You need to build relationships, right? Um, I, I think uh, when people look at, at you, Shannon, or, or me, we're, you know, we're not at the peak of where we want to be and having the influence that we, have, we want to have on people, yet um, there's perceptions of marginal success, and and people think, wow, look at you! You get to speak at all these companies, and you know, um, travel. Or we used to travel, and, and you know, do all these things without really thinking about all the work that went into building that moment. And it's not so. People look at what I've built, um, uh, and I've been doing this full time for about two years. And so people say, like, oh, that's uh, you know, two years, whatever. No, this is like twenty years, right? Like this is. Uh, relationships that I've built, reputations that I've built, and the work that I've been doing, uh, whether it's in the community or not, for my entire adult life, that's coming sort of into fruition now. I think the the core of what I'm hearing you say, Jerry, is that what really matters, like the investments that you make in other people matters because it changes lives. It changes perspective. That's really profound. So where can people find you, Jerry? People can find me. Um, I'm, I'm very loud on LinkedIn. Um, I love being loud on LinkedIn because it's not a place where many other people are loud. Um, I promise to have, so if you go to my website, jerrywan.com, uh, as of this recording, it's being built, but I promise by the time you listen to this, it'll be up. Uh, it, it's on my list of things to complete. Um, uh, and just you know, connect with me anywhere. I, I am easily found on LinkedIn, on Instagram and other places. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to connect with people who want to chat more. Um, obviously if you, um, you know, want to, want to talk more, um, about some of the topics that I shared or invite me to your organization to have these conversations more privately or more intimately, I would love to do that. Um, and so I, I want to encourage people out there, you know, uh, live life on your own terms. I know it's hard, uh, living under the expectations of your your parents, your your society, your friends, even yourself, of this construct that you've defined for yourself is what success means. So do 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 what you want and work your ass off, um, and you know leave leave something good for your kids. Life life is not that hard. Yeah. Your other website is justlikemedia.com. and if you think it's just like me. And then DIA and it's it's a great site that has like so many different places that you can go to learn and know more about Jerry and his work and learn from his guests. So thank you for investing your precious time with us today. No, thank you for having me. Uh, the, the work that you do, Shannon, I think both publicly and, you know, with the work that you do with your clients is, is fantastic. We need more people like you. Um, and it's been so fun to talk to you today. And uh, shout outs to your, your team who, who uh, have been one of the best experiences pre-show uh, from logistical perspective to to prep and to uh, get ready for today. So shout out to everybody who's made this possible. Thank you, Jerry. Awesome. Thank you. ROG takeaway tip, how to apply what we've learned to our own work and lives. Jerry shared his thoughts about identity and it made me think, What factors contribute to our identity? Once we're born, we have some form of identification like a birth certificate. 
and then we travel and get a passport or learn to drive and get a license. Those identification documents tell others about us, height, weight, image, where we live, identification number. But the kind of identification that we're talking about here goes way beyond those things. Here are 12 components to our identity in no particular order to get our wheels in motion on this consideration. Our identity includes, but is not limited to, number one, family and relationships. With whom do you belong? Where are you in the birth order? How large is your extended family? Who are your chosen family? What are your family traditions and rituals? What holidays do you celebrate? Number two, talents and abilities. What are your strengths and skills? In what ways do you and have you offered value and it comes naturally? Are you a problem solver? Do you have technical skills? Perhaps you are a really empathic listener and you hold space for others. What are your talents and abilities? Number three, race, ethnicity, cultural heritage. Where did your family originate? How has that shaped your understanding of the world and how you fit in? Where were you born? Where is your citizenship? How has that influenced the narrative that you tell about who you are? Number four, defining moments and experiences. We can identify with other groups who have had similar experiences like starting a business, losing a child, breaking an addiction, engaging on a mission trip, having a child, having a disability, raising a child with a disability. There are many defining moments and life experiences that factor into our identity. Number five, gender orientation. How do you identify? Male, female, fluid, both, neither? How does that affect your identity? What clothes do you wear? What restrooms do you use? How does your gender affect how you think, feel, and behave? Number six, beliefs and values. What do you believe in? What are your core values? How do those beliefs and values affect your worldview, choices, and behaviors? Number seven, physical appearance and characteristics, height, weight, hair, no hair, if hair, color, length, texture, style, skin color, facial features. Like when you put together a bitmoji of yourself, what are the things that you choose? How well does that bitmoji identify you? Number eight, education, high school, college, trade school, advanced degree. How does that influence your self-identity? How has education been valued in your family of origin? How has that influenced you? Number nine, occupation. How old were you when you started working? What jobs have you had? Perhaps you went into the military post high school. Maybe you were recruited as a professional athlete or musician at a young age. Have you worked for the same company all of your professional life? Have you worked for many different companies? What are your occupational talents and gifts? How have you or do you use those talents? Number 10, age. How old are you in years? And what does that mean to you? According to your beliefs, are you too, T-O-O, something? Or look too something, too old, too young? Number 11, roles. You're a child of someone. So who are your parents? Are you a sibling, parent? Have furry children like pets? Who are your friends, neighbors, community members? What roles do you play in your family, friendships, and community? There are so many elements to our identity. When Jerry recommends that we greet each person with curiosity as opposed to judgment, how could we not? Look at this short list that we've outlined. We are remarkably interesting and unique. Be curious about yourself and others. It's amazing how remarkably similar we all are, yet none of us are the same. Know your worth and value others. Join us next week for Dr. Omolara. She's a medical professional who experienced her limits. And since then, she's dedicated her work to medicine, self-love, and empowering others to build businesses and make a difference. Until next week, stay generous, everyone. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. Please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.